So this week, I am with my friend, Noelle Nociolo, who not only were we briefly roommates back, back, back in the day in New York City when she was an enormously talented student at Fordham, right? Fordham, yep. that's where you were going, I believe, yep. okay? And, um, but then she's originally from California, so we actually just got to see each other recently in California. And so many of you listening have been emailing and writing about, you know, moving abroad and visa processes. And that's pretty much all Noelle and I have been talking about, um, going through our own processes. <laughs> and she's a world traveler. And so there's a lot to discuss, but welcome, Noelle. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. Of course. And just uh, to preface this to everybody, her voice is going to sound much nicer than mine because she's a trained singer, actress, all the above. And we'll get into the vocal coach part of it um, with what she does with the fitness business now. But why don't you start and tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of where you're from and what you initially trained in and what you're in now? Too nice. So I am initially from Southern California, moved to Northern California when I was four up north of Sacramento on a farm. And then when I was about 10, we moved right near Yosemite National Park. So the Sierra Nevada mountains, where it was 30 minutes one way to a grocery store or to high school and an hour and 15 to 20 minutes one way to the rest of civilization, ballet class, culture, Costco, <laughs> you name it. <laughs> so I grew up very remote and rural but both of my parents are from Southern California, both went to UCLA, played sports, and always had family, friends, doctors in Southern California. So I joke that I might as well have been born on the road because <laughs> everything was either, you know, eight hours one way or four hours one way to appointments and family functions and that sort of thing. So I've always been very at home in the car, but I don't drive. <laughs> And there's a story there drive. too. I, oh, don't I don't drive. Even think I knew that. Okay, so um, <laughs> so speaking of of the rural part of California, so I grew up a dancer, and we would drive about an hour and twenty minutes each way to Fresno, where I was in ballet, and it was time for Nutcracker, and I had just gotten my learner's permit and had asked my mom if I could drive that night, and we were kind of in a rush, and she said, "No, let's do that another time." You know, I, I really. I really just want to get there and I know the roads. And thankfully she did she did that. I, I did not get behind the wheel that night or we probably wouldn't be talking, but we oh, no. hit a an enormous four point or five point buck who <laughs> a deer who just ran right into our Volvo, deployed the airbags. Once it was a oh, two lane gosh. highway, one side was an embankment down a cliff, the other side was a shoulder. Thankfully, my mother is an excellent driver and just held the wheel and was able to bring us over to the side of the road. Um, but when the airbag, this is early, this is the mid 90s. So airbags were relatively new technology. So when they mm -hmm. deployed on my side, I had a major nylon burn on my face, which <gasps> oh, somehow God. didn't scar. I don't know how that how I got so lucky, but I'm truly lucky. But I really honestly, Carrie, I just didn't want to drive after that. It was Fair enough. Out. I've I've literally been warned yeah. about that my entire life. It was hitting deer or for mm -hmm. Canada hitting a moose, which is like you're oh, dead yes. if that happens. Peak Canada. So yes. that's oh, peak Canada. Yes. That is always like, but it always scares me, and so I'm constantly like so paranoid. But there's nothing you can do, like you said, if they decide to jump out, they that's jump it. out, and there's no there's no swerving. And he was. But I'm huge. glad you're here. Yeah. Thank you. Me too. He was <laughs> huge and beautiful, and we. My mother actually just replaced her last Volvo, but she's had seven Volvos in her time. And dedicated. Very dedicated. You know, they're very safe car. We did overseas delivery for the last car and went to Gothenburg, Sweden, where they make them. And so, she, of course, we told them the story of what happened in the previous S60. And, you know, obviously, the, the car was actually not totaled, which was amazing. There was a lot of damage, but they were able to fix. But, That's you crazy. Know, we, we joked that I just we should have been commercial. <laughs> yeah, no, but literally you get to be a commercial. Yeah. So how do you get from that rural experience then to prompt you to go to New York City? Perfect. Yes. So I, from the time I was little, I wanted to be in New York City. I went to see cats 
in San Francisco, Cats the Musical, not Cats the mm -hmm. Animal, Cats the Musical in San Francisco <laughs> about 1985, yeah. 1986, and was very, I was a very theatrical child, I'm an only child, so it was always like prancing around and acting like a cat to mimic what I saw <laughs> at the Golden Gate Theater and was in dance. And the minute I knew what Juilliard was, I said, well, that's it, I'm moving to New York City. And I did move to New York City and I didn't go to, to Juilliard. I went to Fordham's Lincoln Center campus, which is funnily enough, just on the other side of Lincoln Center from Juilliard. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, and I moved when I was 17 years old. I, I'm young for my grade. So I'll never forget it. It was one of those very typical Hollywood-esque moments where I went out to the mailbox on a Saturday morning to check the mail back when we had college acceptances via mail and not via email. And I had my big welcome Fordham packet. And I remember just screaming and crying and freaking out and running from the mailbox. And both of my parents came out on the porch and it was like, that was it. I mean, that's I like had a to dream. Have my, yeah, I had to have financial aid. But once the financial aid <laughs> went through, I, I, was, I was very grateful and relieved and, and fortunate. But yeah, I moved to New York City when I was 17 years old and I stayed for 15 years, which is in hindsight pretty wild, especially since it was 1999 that I moved um, about a month after JFK Jr. was killed. That's right. And I, Wait, 1999 is when you moved? I, I moved in 1999, yes, in August. That's so funny. We, I was literally interning, like, I think in 98 is oh, when I was funny. at Seventeen Magazine. There you go. And I always say this, and I think you'll agree with this mm -hmm. too, it's like, Aside from going to school and like a top tier school like you did, I mean, I think New York City itself is one of the best educations because you are thrown into everything. Mm -hmm. And kids that are born and raised there are like smart as hell by the time they're five. It's like I felt like I was playing catch up for like the first number of years being yes. there. But I mean, it's, it's an incredible experience. And especially, like you said, for people that don't know New York. Right. That part um, where the school is in the Upper West Side, you have like incredible art institutions there and ballet and and uh, opera, and it's really just being dropped into some of the best art circumstances you could possibly be in. For some reason, I'm thinking about the movie Center Stage in the back of my mind, oh, which is not the top representation. Oh, see, there you go. They filmed that actually the summer, the summer yeah. before I moved. Um, a couple of the white box theater spaces that are in the end of the movie are actually the theater spaces that Ford and Theater Department, which I'm a graduate of, used those mm -hmm. spaces. And then you mentioned the Met, I, I got to usher as a part-time usher That's at the right. Metropolitan Opera House from about 18, 19, I started to, I think I, well, I, I lived with you right out of college. So I, that would have been yeah. 2003. I think I stopped working there about 2005. So even just on a part-time basis, it was just so fantastic to be, like you say, so literally good. that dialed into the arts. Oh my God. It's just like, yeah, you're really in the middle of everything and yes. the best of the best. And I remember when you ushered there, because I mean, yes. you got to obviously, you could be able to watch like a lot of performances as well. Yes. And I just remember for somebody who desperately wishes they could sing and can't, but still does anyways. All good. I would like hear you just like just casually singing. And I was just so envious because this gorgeous trained voice Too coming nice. out like, like unbelievable. So nice. Um, but I mean, what an incredible experience. It was. And I know you yeah. were doing so many different things after that, but eventually, and I'm not trying to skip forward, but not this all ties in. We this have so much to in. talk about. Yes. <laughs> but at some point in, in all of this, you know, you've always been active from, from dance and clearly even like vocal training is still like a physical feat. Yes. So you, but then you started getting more invested in the fitness industry. So kind of how did that come about? And it grew to somewhere very interesting. So talk a little bit about that. Yes. So as I'm sure you can appreciate, you know, living in New York City takes a significant amount of income to mm -hmm. not constantly be running around eating ramen noodles and bagels and dollar pizza <laughs> slices. So mm -hmm. um, I started working in, I don't remember, 2005, I think, 2006, something like that. I started working at a tea house on the Upper West Side called Alice's Teacup. Um, <gasps> That's right. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I it's made some great just one. wonderful friends out of both regulars that would come in. Uh, one of my closest friends was a regular, funnily enough, she and her husband. Um, and then friends that you make, you know, working at a job like that, because it's all, you know, young people generally in the arts. Uh, one of the girls worked around the corner at this tiny little fitness studio right around the corner on 72nd Street. It didn't have a sign. There was a rickshaw out in front, you know, getting a ticket every other day because you weren't allowed to have signage. It was a 
historical landmark and she said you know there's this there's this cycling class around the corner if you want to go take it and I was like I don't ride bikes I don't want to go so about a year of, of begging me because at the time the soul cycle rear lobby just there was not that much traction at the beginning you know they were asking folks even if they were affluent to pay a premium for something a la carte with a class package when everybody had an equinox membership right so <laughs> It was not busy at the beginning. And I, I think it's important to keep reminding ourselves that of that now, you know, even the biggest overnight sensations are obviously not busy at the beginning. Um, right. So there was always a bike for me and she just kept, I'll comp you in, come to a class. And she finally got me there in 2007 and that was it. It was engaging, fun, inspiring, difficult. The instructor was probably in her late 40s, but she was playing all this mm. relevant music of what had come out recently. And I, you know, I grew up going to dance class. I grew up in choir and, and drama. So for me, the idea of going to a gym never really resonated, but the idea of going to a class did. And especially yeah. a kind of class that places such a high premium on the music, the energy, the branding, the hospitality. It was really fantastic. And my, my first job out of college was working at Jean-Georges, Chef Jean-Georges von Richten's corporate office. So I had a bit of an understanding of what makes for a great hospitality experience. And I saw mm -hmm. that with the original version of Soul Cycle. It was very, very well done from beginning to end. So that's actually how I started in fitness. I started taking class three or four times a week. I did that for years. When Flywheel Sports opened in the Flatiron, they had a much more cost-effective membership. They had an unlimited membership at the beginning for $150 a month. And it was yours until you decided to cancel it. When you canceled it, it, that was it. And I would go to classes in both studios. I had no idea that there was beef between the two. I didn't pay attention. I just, <laughs> I wanted to, I love, I got to where I loved being on a bike. And after taking classes, you know, very, very regularly for four years, I was in Paris visiting a friend and I found out that a colleague of mine had had passed away. He it was a terrible accident. It was awful. And the same day I was told by another restaurant where I was working via text message that they didn't have any shifts for me on the schedule. Mm -hmm. So it was this very intense all at once, you know, people give this analogy a lot. You, two forks in the road, which one are you going to take? But there, there is, there is a fork in the road at that point. That's right. And I thought, you know, I'd always looked at food and, at the food and beverage industry, whether I was, you know, working as an assistant for Chef Jean Georges, or I was, you know, waitressing at Alice's Teacup. I always looked at that as my plan B. And there kind of comes a time, I think, where if you are not in the hospitality F and B track because you want to open your own establishment, you want to invest, you want to be a manager, et cetera, et cetera. There kind of comes a time when you have to decide, hey, this isn't doing it for me anymore. What else yeah, do I want to 100%. do? Yeah, 100%. And that's what fitness became. I came home from that trip to Paris. I called one of the original uh, folks who teaches at Soul Cycle still. She's a senior master instructor. And we had, we had drinks at the bar at Ditch Plains on the Upper West Side. And I talked to her about maybe auditioning and becoming an instructor, told her why it was interesting to me. And she was very helpful and very complimentary and just said, you know, yeah, you won't make money for the first year, but you'll have, you know, you'll learn, you'll, you'll, you'll build, you'll learn who you are, what your persona is in the room, and this will be a great plan B for you. And so I auditioned and in 2011 and I did their teacher training, which at the time was nine months long from audition to final, which is insane to think about. That also happened to be the summer of the Equinox acquisition. So it was a very mm. interesting time to be very enmeshed in that culture. Um, you don't pay for it, but you also are not at the time you did not have to pay for it. So I received months of uh, soft skill training with music and energy and hospitality points and how to really develop your, your secret sauce as an instructor. But I never learned how to ride a bike and my body was aching. And yeah, I, form. it's amazing how many people don't even go into that. It's crazy. Yep. And there was, um, well, there was just so much about, though there, there is so much, unfortunately, about the programming that 
does not align with um, anatomy, physiology, and exercise science. Mm -hmm. So when I got through the, the end of the training, it was, you know, in so many ways, such a great experience and in other ways, such an awful one as most things are, right? So I, there was eight of us in our group. I was the only person that did not get a job at the time that was devastating. But in hindsight, it was the best it's thing that ever happened best. to me. It's for the best, always, always. And I'll just interject really quickly yes. because for people listening to this, like a lot of people now have taken spin classes. Right. But the time you're, you know, what you're talking about then, like it really was, you know, there was basic, basic, basic cycle stuff. And then there's, there, there was a real elevation of experience. Um, and even today, like I, I, was, I spin all around the world. I'm like a dedicated spinner. And it's become so obvious where you're just in a class where somebody's just like, you know, do your thing or somebody or versus somebody who's very invested in um, both the psychology and the physicality behind it and form. And like you said, curating the persona, um, using the voice correctly, curating playlists that are fun, like engaging, like it's a lot going on. So yes. like performance goes hand in hand then with this and there's a lot to figure out and I see a lot of bad instructors and then when I have good instructors I click with them right away and all I want to do is be encouraged by them and engage in their classes and I want to learn from them and a lot of times in spin it's both form and getting fit of course properly the proper way because you're right people are hurting themselves left right and center not doing things correctly and then also wanting to be almost like coached by these people and that can have a great effect on you emotionally and psychologically and all the rest of it which like you were saying you know when that didn't one way didn't work out you had this time to really build up your own persona in that space and be like well actually what do I want to do with it a hundred percent and I slowly started taking out the elements of the class that I could feel my body didn't like and it was mm -hmm. I was moving in a way that didn't feel right to me but I was able to take a step back teach at two places in New York City that did not charge $30 a class in 2012, right? So I started teaching at Crunch, uh, yep. which was great. And then I taught at City College of New York on the Upper Upper West Side in there oh, cool. as an intramural class that anybody, anybody that could sign up, you know, anybody could sign up for that was in undergrad, graduate school, you know, the assistant to the to the provost at one point would take class. So anybody within that ecosystem, and it was very low key. And it was in the oh, gym. Interesting. So, I didn't even know that they had one up there, but yeah. I did go to Crunch. I did go oh, to the no, Crunch. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Classes. It's not a, it was actually the gym at City College. So it wasn't Crunch. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. No, no. But you said before you were at Crunch yeah. in City College. So I yeah. then crossed the Crunch. Oh, good. But the thing at City College is amazing. That's yeah, like, it really was. That's great. And it's so funny because I've talked to so many colleagues who also got their start at, at colleges, which is just such wow. a, I think, a very cool, kind of untapped market of you know what some people yeah. teach there during undergrad and other people teach there like I did when they're years out of school and have an opportunity to teach at a college just because the expectations are low it's a great place if you're learning who you are on a microphone in the room same with crunch what a great first place for me to be I just had like a ding 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 moment I'm always thinking like do you know graduate hotels have you heard or seen of them no I haven't there, this is, it, it'll all fit. I promise this makes sense. My brain's always ping-ponging around. Um, there is a company that started these hotels in college towns called Graduate Hotels. And oh, they cool. were both for like parents coming or other people like coming in and out. And they're really cool and funky and fun, but they're specifically in college towns. And now I'm all, all I'm thinking is like, how do we do like branded college gyms or something that's like packaged at the right places. I don't know. Just the thought. Putting it out there. Love Investors that. come at us. Anyway. No, I love that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was such an interesting experience to come out of such a long, intense instructor training at, you know, at the place to train mm -hmm. with multiple locations and an opportunity to make six figures and have a rabid following and all of that. And then about, you know, a year later, I got certified by Schwinn. And I am so oh, grateful nice. that yeah. the person who certified me, Rachel Vazzarelli, um, has a great personality and is an, outdoor, is an outside writer, outdoor writer, but also understands music. She was a dancer. You know, she gets it. She understands that you are an entertainer. You have to make, especially if you're going to teach a straight class without stuff in it, you know, no weights on a bike, no dance moves on a bike. If you're going to teach a straight class, you know, those those instructors are sort of at a disadvantage from people that have all the bells and whistles because 
there's nothing to hide behind. You have to be engaging, inspiring. You have to have a persona. You have to have great music. You know, you have to practically be a stand-up comedian to get folks to be excited have, about doing hard things, right? A lot. And this is like a little bit of a, I mean, this is a much a longer answer, but what would you, what would your basic advice be to people who want to go train in something like today? For fitness? We're like, hey, I'll, yeah, let's say fitness or spin specifically, things that are studio related. Is there like, just be careful of this and this, just a couple of top things? So not all of the, I think it's, it's extremely important that you get certified. And mm -hmm. a lot of people will take a certification and unfortunately will have an opposite experience as what I did at, you know, with Schwinn with Rachel was they'll have somebody that just is not as, is not as interesting and does not make the material that's dense and peer reviewed and anatomy and physiology and how to structure a class. If you don't have a great master trainer making that fun and engaging and, and putting it into your own words, into your own language, you're going to come out of there being like, what was that? So yep. on one side, I say, absolutely, please get certified. You, you must. And on the other side, not all certifications are created the same. I've been to some yep. very bad certifications. So I would say try to do the Schwinn primary, uh, primary cycling training. I can't remember what, what they're calling it now, but it's one eight or nine hour training. You can do them online. You can do them at a facility. That's a great one. It's very entry level. It's got fun personality points and it also has the science. I think that's extremely yeah. important. It's good advice and finding what you what you're bringing to the table, I guess, in terms of making it a unique experience. And that, as well. yeah, and that's sort of where we're going to go to next. I have a feeling because, <laughs> and this is sort of the 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 gap in the market, right? You know, like I mentioned earlier, when for example, when SoulCycle started and their target demographic all already had Equinox memberships, they had to answer the question just like any founder right now, whether they have a bar studio or a yoga studio, Pilates cycling, climbing, rowing, whatever, yep. those founders have to answer the question of, you know, hey, I have a such and such membership, Virgin Active, David Lloyd, Equinox, Crunch, whatever. I have, a, I have this membership where it's all in whatever I want for X amount per month. Why should mm -hmm. I pay extra to come to your studio? Yep. And studio owners have got to have an answer to that. And it can't yeah. just be, oh, I have a million euro build out in the best toilets you've ever seen. It has to be, I have great classes. They're certified through such and such. And then they also go through an internal training. They're super fun. There's personality music for everyone. We've got a juice bar. We've got this. We've got that. It's like cheers. Everybody knows your name. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. And this is really the rise of music fitness, right? A hundred percent, which is the perfect segue to, <laughs> so part of the reason Noel can give you all these good answers is exactly this. We're going to talk about the, the pivot to building out boutique studio fitness experiences and also how that parlayed into travel. So take it away. So I made a big mistake in college and I did not study abroad. And I really mm, should. Have. I wish I did that too. Yeah, I know, right? I regret it. Well, yeah. you and I both have more than made up for it now. We have. As we have. Post grads. <laughs> Um, but I did not, I loved being in New York City for that four years. Yeah. So on one hand, I'm sorry that I didn't study abroad. On, a, on another hand, I'm glad I didn't. On one hand, I would have been studying abroad the semester of September 11th. On the other hand, that was a defining moment of my life. So that's right. What can I say? Mm -hmm. um, I answered a Craigslist ad in January <laughs> of 2014 that I felt like was written for me. It was a startup in Singapore that was looking for somebody from New York City who had either gone through teacher training at Flywheel Sports or at SoulCycle, but was not currently teaching there because they wanted somebody to come to Singapore for two months and train instructors for the first indoor cycling boutique in Southeast Asia. Oh my God. I don't even think I knew how you started. Okay. This is great. It, Keep going. <laughs> I feel like every time I indulge myself in sharing this story, it is, it is just it never becomes any less bananas to me either. Yeah, it's great. So I saw this ad and I, I happened to see this ad because, you know, I found you and I were Craigslist roommates. Mm -hmm. I found another apartment that way. I had found a couple of cycling jobs that way. You just never know what you're going to find on there. So every so often I would look. Yep. And when I read this ad, Carrie, I just went, this is made for me. 
And the, the, the rub is that at that time, especially na- nowadays, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but in 2014, you know, you have to audition. Flywheel, unfortunately, is no longer since, since COVID started, but you had to audition to, to teach at these places. You had to audition to even go into their training. You had to audition. And then once you wow. finish the training, you had to audition again in order to get on the schedule. Kind of like if anybody's familiar with a BFA theater program, Mm -hmm. it's the same thing. You audition to go to college and then you would audition again after your second second year of conservatory to be sure that you actually are going to cut the mustard to finish your opera degree, your dance degree, your theater, whatever. This is so intense. I'm already stressed. I know it's super (laughs) stressful, right? So, so there needs to be a hundred percent success rate with these studios or it's you're giving away your intellectual property. If you're going to train 10 people and they're going to learn all your trade secrets, you better have 10 jobs for them. Right. Yeah. Or at week three or four or whatever it is, you better have some kind of sit down. Hey, we don't think you're right for us. Blah, 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 blah. Guess what? That did not happen to me. I got to the end of a nine month training and just didn't get a job. So again, like I took all of that and then I took the proper training that I learned from Schwinn and was just teaching around New York City, 15 to 20 classes a week, running around like a crazy, crazy human. And then I I saw this Craigslist ad. So I answered it. And honestly, the rest is history. We had a Skype call. We had probably 20 emails back and forth. A friend of mine's an attorney. She drew up a contract. There was an amendment on their side. We did a PayPal um, deposit. They sent me a Singapore Airlines flight. I put my room on Craigslist in Brooklyn. You know, I talked to my roommate about it. I did two bedroom apartment at the time. You know, we found a subletter to live in my room and that was it. And I left March 15th. I started exchanging wow. emails with them the end of January. I left on March 15th. That was it. And so how did, how do you like living there? It's great there. I loved it actually. Yeah. I knew, and they knew also, we all really got along great. And we kind of all knew from the beginning that, I mean, it was the wild west. So if anybody's listening to this right now being like, oh, I was just in Singapore and I took such and such class. Like, yes, of course you did. Cause it's now 2022 yep. or That's whatever right. year we're listening. <laughs> but in 2014, there was one big yoga studio there were all different price point big box gyms, and there were a couple of personal training type gyms, but that was it. Uh, there were no bar studios, there were no cycling studios, there was nothing. You're not on the MRT in Lululemon. Like there wasn't a Lululemon, okay? Right, yeah, the trajectory of like the growth around that stuff Insane. was fast. It's been, yeah. it's been very, very exponential. Um, so they knew and I knew, you know, wow, like you really get along, we're building something really special here, this is, this is scalable throughout the region. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's do it. And unfortunately, the partners did not, um, they made a lot of really hard lessons. They learned a lot of very hard lessons and that they did not allocate their shares and valuation on the business side in a very thoughtful way. And so Mm -hmm. one partner was able to buy out the kind of bamboozle the other. I'm not going to get into it. It was just a really sad yeah, sure. situation. And so it did not end up, it did not end well. And the studio did subsequently uh, get sold and then closed a few years later. But the later version was not at all the first version. But anyway, but to get back to all, to, to get back to the explosion of fitness in Southeast Asia, I knew at that point that I after spending just a few weeks there, I thought, you know, I've been looking for a reason to leave New York City. This is a great reason to leave New York City. I'm going to leave in early 2015, which is what I did. And I, I officially left New York in February of 2015, sold everything, donated, uh, got some stuff to California, and that was it. Um, unfortunately, a few months later, the studio in Singapore ended up imploding as well with what I intimated a minute ago about the ownership. Oh no, yeah. But that became the calling card. So Hong yeah. Kong already had a fitness industry, a boutique fitness industry that's, you know, at using LA and New York City as it's as it's what they were emulating. Mm-hmm. Singapore came next. And other soon to be founders from all over the region, you know, go to Hong Kong and Singapore, at, not even just with fitness with any sort of new concept, they'll go to the financial yeah. hubs to see where trends are going and to check out and do recon trips to see about bringing whatever concept back to their place. 
So it's like right time, right place, and it was snowballing. Exactly. And I kind of <laughs> joke that all of the subsequent studio clients that I've had since are all the same, the same, a different iteration of the same persona. Meaning, hi, I went to USC, NYU, LSE in London. I went to Georgetown. Da 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 da. I fell in love with fill in the blank concept. I want to bring fill in the blank concept back to fill in the blank city. So yep. doing that first Singapore project opened me up by complete accident to working in Bangkok, Jakarta, Shanghai, Manila, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and that's just Asia. Because folks yeah, saw and I, because this you and were went, gone there for a while. Yeah, so I was yeah. in and out for a while. I'd worked in Latin America a bit too, and U.S. and Canada and Europe, little in Europe, but. You know, especially in Asia, everybody just kind of went like, well, wait a second. Their back, the background of the, these founders are either lawyer, finance, family mm -hmm. business, brand management for a Fortune 500 company, investor, family money. And there's nothing wrong with any of these things, but that's not fitness. So just because you've taken a bunch of classes and you fell in love with the concept and you ride very well, that's great, but that does not mean you can sit down, write a manual, teach instructors, give classes, and then especially give a class experience that's worth 40 sing dollars, right? So yeah. that's where somebody like me comes in. And I happen to be in You're the right having, place at the right time. You really did. And I was just thinking how I'm going to totally mess up this quote. No, Something not at all. Oprah always says, she says, it's not luck is, is preparation meets opportunity, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So in a way... You had done a lot of training in these two things yes. that ultimately meshed together yes. in like a market that's expanding that yes. needs somebody with a very wide breadth of skills. So this is why I tell, I tell people two things, especially like people coming up. It's like one, you never know where you're going to go. So if you have natural aptitude towards certain things or skills, like you can keep growing those up and they can build into a lot of different things, right? People sometimes are like, oh, I can only use this for, yet, for this, but that's just not true. And you can make a lot of different career pivots and they can fit and you can use your unique skills in a lot of ways. And the second, which will tie into kind of what we're going to be talking about with visas, is globalization. Because in the world that we live in, like you said, places are being influenced by certain cities, or maybe there's a trend coming out of somewhere that's like spreading everywhere. Like there are opportunities if you have this understanding and you have this skill set and you have the time to really be hustling to reach out to these people like you did to, to package and explain this to people and the value of it, then they get it. So there's always... Because people always want to learn, they always want to train, whether it's a, a business, right, or their employees, like there's these kinds of opportunities. And you were, or you have been abroad, like for a very long time, because I'd always check in, you were in a different place. And clearly, you would take advantage, much like people in entertainment too, to like travel in the interims as yes. well. So you would take these like multi stop trips, which yes. of course, I'm also a big fan of. And ultimately, because I think, I mean, obviously we'll skip over the pandemic because all of us had to put things on pause, but now things are back open. We're raring to go. There's a lot of opportunities. You have a boutique fitness like consultancy. Um, you were also going to be doing some other stuff around, I'm going to get this wrong. Is it voice? It is. Voice training. Yes. Yeah. Which is also key because people are screaming and as mm -hmm. you said, should not be hurting and injuring their voice if they're doing multiple classes. Absolutely not. Yeah. But the, the beauty of this with your kind of business is you can do this and be based from wherever you deem you really want to be. I mean, within reason, right? Sure. But this kind of brings us to the crux of this oh, because yeah. as people know, listening to me, I've been living in the UK and talked a lot about all of these opportunities. You've got short term for di digital nomads, but there are longer term solutions for longer stays. Um, whether they're work visas or non-lucrative visas where you're in, to resident, your path to residency and everything. And so randomly, you and I started talking about this like this year. And at the time, you were looking at Portugal, which is where there is a load of expats, mainly Americans that have already moved to or are in the process of. And you shared a lot of valuable information with me. But then surprise bonus, <laughs> you are of Italian heritage. Uh, which means in the immediate, as in grandparents, so you can apply for the ancestral, whatever they're calling it, that visa for Italy. And I think like that's really interesting because I've met more and more people that have done that, but it's not as clear cut as people make it out to be. <laughs> so maybe you can kind of start on where your thinking was in your original pro approach was to Portugal and kind of now what you're discovering on your path to Italy. Yes. 
So one very key um, correction I do need to make is that for folks that oh, sure. have an, an Italian ancestry, and I'll get into into how mm-hmm. they do this, it is actually it's actually dual citizenship. It is a full fledged oh, yeah. Italian passport rather than a visa. And you know, obviously that. Oh, sorry, that's what that's I meant. Okay. Yeah, the, no, no, the, that's on the okay. road. <laughs> All good. I just think it's really in, important because we will mm-hmm. talk about visas, but then we'll also talk about this passport. So, for sure. So I, like you mentioned, I'm extremely, extremely fortunate in that I am Sicilian on my mom's side and Italian on my dad's side. Um, mm-hmm. I pulled threads on both sides of my family. Turns out my dad's side is a very clear line to Italy via my great grandfather who came to the United States from Avellino in 1912. So crazy stories ensued. We could be here all day talking about the crazy stories, <laughs> but I'll just make it really short and say that a lot of extraordinary things had to happen in order for me to qualify. And I think anybody that probes into their ancestry for second citizenship, if they're Irish or if they're Italian, especially, are going to find their own version of what they thought the family lore was mm-hmm. and in actuality what what happened. A hundred percent. Yes. We talked about that a bit when we saw each other yeah. in Santa Barbara. A lot of surprises. Oh, yeah. yes. So there were quite a few surprises on my side as well um, that I'll keep private for now. But basically, long story <laughs> short is Italy offers dual citizenship by um, blood birthright by blood. It's Jur sanguinis, I'm probably saying that incorrectly, but it's JS for short. And there's a very clear cut application process. TLDR, you need the birth certificate of your Italian ancestor from the Comune that they were born in, in either, you know, Sardinia, Italy, or Sicily. And then you need every other document from them to that proves your line to Italy. So in my case, it's all of the men, great grandfather, grandfather, father, me. So birth, marriage, death certificates. If somebody was divorced, you need that decree. You also need, uh, because in my case, my great-grandfather never naturalized and became American, which is important. Mm -hmm. So there's one piece of information that you have to get certified and and include in your packet. If you're listening to this going, oh, I think I might qualify. The number one thing to know is, did your ancestor naturalize, yes or no? If he or she did, did they naturalize before or after the next generation was born? So, for example, my grandfather was born in New Jersey in 1926. Had my great grandfather become an American citizen prior to 1926, the line would be cut and I would not qualify. Had he become American in 1927, that would be fine because he actually passed his Italian citizenship on to my grandfather at birth. And I mentioned he was born in 1926. Right. So that is the first step to determine eligibility. If the alarm bells are ringing in your head as you listen to us, the first step is find out when they naturalized, if they did, because you will have to prove it. So I have a, I have a document from the national archives that is certified that I will get a postule that will go with me in my packet to say my person, my great grandfather never became American. So it's not about like, it's, it's about a non-broken line at specific times. You're not, are they, is Italy specifically the kind of country that says like, you have to have this, the nearest relation for you to even qualify would have to be like your grandfather versus your great grandfather. No, you can go back as far as you want. But I just say that because Ireland, obviously England is and Ireland are different. They are different. If you are Italian American or Italian Canadian, um, you just have to keep going back until you find it. And you, you have to be sure that there is no cut line. That is, that is number one. Um, and then you, number two is you have to be sure that if there was a first marriage, as there was in my case with my great grandmother, that there was a divorce in the court or that there was a death and then you'll have to have that death certificate of the first husband oh my wife. god so there's a lot of paperwork. they're very particular about the certifications like didn't you have to have paperwork that was like reprinted or something literally within three months or something like that yes so yeah. you need to have fairly recent certified copies of uh, birth marriage and death certificates um, because then you'll have to have them apostille based on, based on state of origin. So like, for example, in my family, 
all of our births, marriages, and deaths come from New Jersey, Nevada, and California. So I am batching out all of my documents from each state and sending them off for apostilles. And that's per the Hague Convention, I think 1961, somewhere along the lines where basically TLDR, Europe wants to be sure that any of the certified information they're getting from any of the 50 states and the District of Columbia and all the U.S. territories, they want to be sure that that is all uniform and mm -hmm. that is basically an international notary. So yeah. anything, that, if you want to do the JS or the JM uh, process for Italian second citizenship, if you're married to an Italian citizen, you want to do matrimonis, everything has to be certified long form, everything has to be apostilled, and then everything has to be translated into Italian. Yeah, so, so anybody three, listening, like, three process. If, you're in, if you're interested in this, like clearly there's a lot of research you need to do not just from like there's you'll read one site that has certain rules and then the consulate might have a different set of rules and it definitely is a process but you know both noelle and i agree it's like being part specifically the eu opens up so many opportunities i mean even when i just travel between eu countries everything's so great still breaks my heart that the uk made their brexit decision which is terrible because that would have been even easier for me um, and I'm only sorry that actually the UK doesn't have that same role with the grandparents because, of course, my dad's whole line is from England. And he could have technically had a passport through his grandparents, just did, opted not to. And I'm like, I'm just one, <laughs> one person away. <laughs> right. What is happening? But there's so many beautiful opportunities there in this globalized world. I mean, yes. I, I've written multiple posts about this. You have to really start, I mean, the, the ancestral stuff aside, if somebody's just looking at like, what are my options for visas, not for right. citizenship, or right. I would like to be a citizen in 10 years time, this is going to bring me back to Portugal. Mm -hmm. So people have to start with a lot of questions for themselves. Like, are you just looking to live somewhere for a year, just have an extended stay while you're working remotely and you could prove some basics? Cool. Guess what? Most of Europe is set up for you. You can find a digital nomad visa. Yes. Do you want to look at like, hey, how can I actually live here? and go eventually maybe apply for citizenship or become a even a permanent resident if you don't want to maybe if you want to skirt some tax issues um be like what is my income am i working just random remote jobs do i have a, a company that's based in the us that i can prove income and, and be able to live here uh there are certain countries like spain that are like cool you can do that but then you can't work with spanish companies but you can work with american or other eu companies so there's a lot of like what if scenarios you have to ask yourselves and of course then there's retirees but that's a different set of circumstances so it's really like how do you want to live how long do you want to live are you looking to stay there permanently and where is your money coming in from and most importantly what assets can you prove because that also varies from place to place so this will take me back to for you personally, why before you knew that Italy was like on the table, because I know you were unsure if that was going to be available for you. What was the um, the kind of the the kickoff for Portugal and what, what was the most appealing part of you applying for for visa status there? So that was all super, super accurate and very, very well said. So for me personally, I went I've been to Portugal once. I went the week of the 2016 US presidential election to Lisbon <laughs> and to Algarve. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Beautiful. I just loved the vibe. I just really enjoyed I enjoyed everything about Portugal. Uh, the people, the food, the cost, the language, the climate. I I kind of looked around, but I was living in Asia, I was living and working in Asia at the time, and I kind of looked around and it's like, well, you know, I have this project coming up in Mexico and that's cool. But, you know, if I'm ever just want to be somewhere else, this is going to be back of mind. Um, yeah. And I like Spain a lot, too. In terms of long term fit, Portugal is a little bit faster than Spain. If somebody is looking to have an EU passport through residency, it's five to six years rather than 10. Um, but again, it, folks are going to come in to this whole discussion with their own unique situation and right. circumstances. Portugal has become very, very popular in the last few years. And you mentioned mm -hmm. certain consulate, even for Italian citizenship, you know, the requirements in, in San Francisco are slightly different than the requirements in Boston, for example. Yep. There is not a uniformity. Uh, and the same goes for if somebody is looking for one of the Portuguese D visas, which is the digital nomad visa, um, it's out. This is honestly the specifics are out of my brain at this point since I oh, found out in April that I'm 
absolutely an unrecognized Italian citizenship citizen. I've just sort of <laughs> forgotten about Portugal. Sorry, Portugal. Um, <laughs> if I live there, it will be as a, as a EU citizen, not yeah, as an you're American gonna be EU. on a TV it's, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if you're interested, you'd have to really look up the the specifics of the consulate. So, for example, you know, I'm based in California, so the West Coast is under the jurisdiction of the San Francisco Portugal consulate. And at the mm-hmm. time of this taping, they are the most hard assed of every consulate <laughs> in the United States. You have to go there. You can't mail it in. You, it's very, very specific. They want to see a 12 month lease to go along with your application. So that that's will intense. Mean, and that was, that was new, right? That was yes. like a newer thing they added. That mm-hmm. is new. And that is DC and New York do not require that. They either will require six months or um, a provisional uh, hospitality letter through somebody that you are friends with legitimately or family in Portugal that will host you um, or a six months. And this is not Airbnb or Verbo. This is like taxed through the landlord. This is a registered apartment for such and such. This is not holiday housing. So you can't even go, well, let me Airbnb here for a month, there for a month, figure out where I want to buy, figure out where I want to live. No, you have to be prepared to eat a few months of rent on an apartment that you're not going to live in because your visa isn't approved yet to be able to go. So I don't mean to paint this negative picture, but this is another thing that I would recommend folks really, really look at. And I can't believe I'm about to recommend Facebook, but... There is an excellent Americans in Portugal Facebook group, just like there's an excellent dual U.S. Italian citizenship Facebook group for people that want to DIY their experience. And both groups, depending on what you're looking at, have something like 30 to 40,000 members each. So there's a yeah, lot no, you're, of information. You're right. I was going to say like those expat resource groups are really powerful. And like I jumped off Facebook, but then I went back on just like as a single, like not attached to anybody specifically for groups. And when I moved to the UK too, just the helpful information to prep that move and to keep certain things I needed in the US versus there was incredibly helpful. And so it was so stress-free. And because Portugal certainly is getting bigger and bigger, and it's funny you said that. Actually, I didn't send you this link because I know we, we've been trading links, but it made me think of you. In the last like three weeks, I've seen like a million stories on expats in Portugal, which tells you the numbers that were there. It started with that LA Times article you shared with me. Then CNBC did a whole piece on it. And they had somebody that started, I think it was that Facebook. And back in the day, it was like a few people and nothing happened for a few years. They were just exchanging random things. And now it's just enormous. Um, so that's really, really helpful. But to your point, like people forget, like these countries, you got to prove that you mean business, that you really want to be there, that you yes. do have money coming in. Like they're not just going to be, hey, come in. Right. And I would also say, make sure you're sensitive about where you're moving and understand it because there's loads of people on the ground. Like people forget, like as we're very privileged as Americans to have income, both whether you have a business back in the States or you can make money in other places, but not all of these EU countries, a lot of them do not have high um, like they don't have a lot of high income. They pay very high taxes. So we're coming into a different situation. And I think Lisbon actually shot up in price. Oh my gosh. Moved there. But there, so but there's high. so many beautiful places all along the coast. And like you said, in the Algarve down south, like there's lots of options for you. Um, just be really, really clear about what you have and what you want before you start this process. And there are a number of very helpful websites you had given me the names of some great people that specialize, like from a, a law and visa perspective. There's websites that, you, that I have that you do a drop down to every country in Europe that you can start understanding what you need and, and connecting with specialists. Um, so this is clearly growing for yes. a number of reasons, which we won't necessarily go into here, <laughs> but it's a lot. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. Um but those options are there for you. You just have to really put in the work and the research and the yes. time because I know watching you oh boy. from time. both Portugal and that process and understanding you being like, oh, man, this is going to take like six months at least to like get this organized. And then I also have to prove all this like money and income versus like with Italy. It's interesting because my friends there are a lot of them are on different visas and there are a few that have the ancestral element. I know some people that are still going through that process that their timeline is like, hey, maybe I'm five years out from this. 
And then other people like you, they're like, no, like time is money. Let's go now. Like, let's get this process done, which I think you're very smart to be doing. Um, so I know that it's been like a whole lot of, a lot of, of hoopla, but for Italy specifically, um, I mean, people clearly have to do their own research, but I think that your, your explanation of that, <laughs> just the, the beginning of it is something that people really need to think about. And also who is the family member that is the holder of all the information? Cause that's going to come into play like it did for you. Um, but did you, when you first started, do you look at the Italian consulate? page or were you looking at other group pages to figure out like where to start? So and this is funny, uh, somebody that used to take my cycling class on an app had been posting about this maybe three years ago. And I sent mm. her a message and I went, what are you talking about? And she goes, oh, are you Italian? <laughs> and I, I told her, yeah, you know, I am on both sides, you know, ha ha, Sicilian on one, right? You know, and she gave me the website that was actually for, for a service provider. So it's not an organic website that is just there out of, you know, pure hearted motive. It's more just, I mean, there's great stuff on there, but it's also like, hey, if you want to, if you want to see if you're eligible and get a quote of services, send us your information. And that was great. And I started in that way. And I ultimately chose not to work with them because they only work with one city hall in Italy. And Oof. I want to do it now. <laughs> I want to do it yesterday. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm actually applying in Italy. Since I plan on living in Europe, it made the most sense for me to just expedite the process and become a resident and be there as long as it takes for me to become, you know, for me to have my citizenship recognized and apply for a passport. So I know that not everybody is in that sort of situation like I am. Mm -hmm. But all that to say is I, through this, through this writer of mine, funnily enough, um, I found, like I said, a service provider website. There are others. Um, I was pretty far along in the process and unfortunately spent money on not a lot, but just a couple of things that I ordered that I didn't actually need because the mm -hmm. specifications of what you need to apply in Italy, you need a little bit less than what you need to apply in the United States in Italian consulate. So I wish I would have found the Facebook group sooner because they were able to clear up and very, very succinctly written PDF guides on the Facebook group as well as on Amazing. their website. There's yep. additional information, both as video and as article on their website. I That's will, amazing. I can't think of the name of the website offhand, but I will give it to you. Shoot for the me show links notes. and we'll, yeah, we can hyperlinks in the show notes for yes. sure because it's key. And one thing I'll say about those Facebook groups too is because they're enormously helpful with the expats. But please, 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 for people that have just joined them, like make sure you're searching questions in the yes. search function instead of posting the same question that's probably been posted like 50 billion times because yes. I've seen that and people are getting really frustrated. People have 100% answered your question, I promise you. Yes. It is somewhere in there. <laughs> and yes. you can always connect with somebody that Absolutely. maybe was really specific about it. Mm -hmm. And then you don't waste anybody's time and you can get right down to business. Absolutely. That's what I would say. Absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, and I will be coming hours. to visit you in Italy. Yes, but the hours that I have spent you know, both with the Portugal side, when I thought that maybe I, my grand, maybe my great grandparents weren't actually married after all, and this wasn't going to work. By the way, they were, and it's fine. But when I was pivoted <laughs> over to Portugal while I was waiting on the New Jersey State Archives, I mean, the hours that I would spend drinking coffee, drinking water, taking notes, keyword searching yeah. for stuff, just that I was sure that I was getting it all, because it is a lot. I wish you could just roll up to an Italian city hall and be like, Hey, I'm here. Here's my, here's my, <laughs> my grandfather's birth certificate. What do I need to do? And they'd look at yeah. you like you were insane because there's well, so people, much you have people to do. need a lot of, a lot of patience yes. because we know every time it comes to, it doesn't matter what government it is in yes. the world. It's a lot of bureaucracy. Yes. So you better strap in. I was going <laughs> to say to you that I, my, my first guest ever was uh, Cassandra, who's my friend, who's a travel Italian style. Who's yep. also, she's a New Yorker and she's also an Italian citizen. So at some point she clearly went through that process too, but yes. many years ago. So I'm sure you will cross paths at some point. Oh yeah. And, um, we will share more links and I had written kind of an article on questions to ask yourself. So I'll make sure to link that as That's well. Great. I mean, there's so much we can talk about with trips, but kind of to round this out, I hope people feel inspired to keep going just to be, again, do your research, be really thorough about it because you have to start somewhere. We both did. Um, but because you've traveled a lot as well, and especially like I've enjoyed seeing a lot of your travels in Asia because I haven't been to enough of it. I would ask you, I have always kind of end with a few questions that are kind of based, more travel based that have affected your life. So let's start with that. 
So what would you say, uh, what foreign cultural experience made the largest impact on you from your travel? Oh, wow. I would say either Laos or Myanmar mm. um, really blew me away um, to, to see. We got up early when we were in Luang Prabang to watch the monks receive alms in the morning of, you know, being gifted food and money for the monastery. That was that was incredible to watch. Amazing. And then, of course, you know, Lao is, I believe, I don't know if, if somebody else has, has beaten it to this very, very unfortunate title of being the most bombed place mm-hmm. in the world. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you're also, you can feel the just collective trauma yeah. while you're there and juxtaposed with beautiful scenery and beautiful, loving, big hearted humans. I would yeah. say the same for Myanmar, and that was actually the last trip that I took before COVID. Um, that was February of 2020 that I spent two weeks in Burma, which is hard it, to even begin to talk oof. about with what yeah. has happened there since. And um, I'll leave it at that. Yes, devastating. I mean, I think something is interesting, something I've asked a few people, and maybe this will kind of tie into that, as I've always asked, you know, where have the the happiest group of people like where's a country with the happiest group of population that you've experienced and a lot of people answer different asian countries and it doesn't mean that those countries have an abundance of like what you know americans would deem what would make them happy which clearly doesn't because it's based in monetary reasons but did you has that kind of been your experience that you have found those people and i guess happy is a kind of a, a very wide range but just like warm open people Hospitable, yes, yeah, for sure. Hospitable. The Balinese folks, mm-hmm. um, my tour guide in Siem Reap, who took me around Angkor Wat, was exceptional. Burmese folks, um, Thai, my time in Thailand was very, very interesting, especially because, you know, it's easy to just say the name of a country, especially one like Indonesia that has so many hundreds yeah. of millions of people and subcultures and islands and religions. But I think for me to see the regional differences when it came to both people's energy, their occupations, their incomes, their crops, the way they worship, um, how they view the government, how they view their family, it's also very regional. So, (laughs) oh yeah, I would say the the hospitality in Southeast Asia is something very special. I think the interesting, the cultural interesting parts are always regional, because I think even when I'm explaining the U.S. to people, I'm like, it's very different experience depending where you are. Oh, absolutely. So I will leave it at that for now. Absolutely. (laughs) Yes. It's a very different experience. Um, And then finally, you know, as someone who's been like myself, you're very independent. You've created a lot of stuff for yourself. You're a curious person that drives you around the world to learn and to try new things and to do this. It's a hard thing to ask or to answer, so don't think of it in too broad a terms. But I always say, what would you tell your younger self about adventuring or learning from others around the world, especially other women? Say yes. Ah. Do it. Yep. You don't know when you're going to get back. You have no yep. idea if there will be an accident. You have no idea if you'll be sick. You have no idea what the future holds. So if you have That's an right. opportunity, take it. Go. Because it'll make for a great story. 100%. I wish people would stop thinking about anything in boxes because it's just a lie. Just go go out, do your thing. Yes. So, I mean, I'm so glad. Look where we started in yes. our cool little apartment on the Upper West Side. And now we're like out and about. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> every time every time we DM, DM each other, we're like somewhere completely different around I the world. It was that. like a miracle. We were both in California. No, it really, it really was. And I'll just, I, I don't know if I said this earlier. I want to be sure I share this. For me, the reason to to seek out second citizenship in Italy is yes, of course, I want to live there. And of course, it will make working in in the European Union much, much easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to do something for me that was not tied to a partner and that was not tied to a job. Amen. This was the way I was able to do it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, I'm, I'm that's literally what's driving me as well. So I really appreciate that. I and I hope that. other women listening to this, like you can do it. 
Yes. You really can. There's so many different ways that you can segue into this. And I'm not saying like, leave everything behind. I mean, some people need to, that's fine too. But <laughs> you can continue to create your life in other layers and other experiences. And it's a beautiful way to do it. Yes. So I just hope more people look into those possibilities because now is better time than ever. Do it, it now really because is. it will take longer than you think and you have to be patient. I put my foot right oh, on the gas point. the same day that I found out Italy was happening. I ordered all my documents and I'm still sitting yeah. here a few months later. So do it yesterday. Start the process. Yeah. Oh, yours. That's so good. We're going to end it on that. But um, we will put links in the show notes, everybody. Please be inspired by Noelle and uh, find your next adventure.